Hey, welcome back to the Midday q and I'm your host, the Duck Man. Are you get tired of these laughs yet? And we're back today with another exciting episode of my 1956 Volkswagen Beetle, also known as Eleanor. <laughs> I couldn't leave it out. But anyways, we got a lot of questions about the rear pop-outs that I put on here. I did some motorized versions, which are completely electronic, and I'm really, really excited about these. Despite showing proof of concept in the very first video where I put them together to demonstrate that they do work, there are still so many people that love to tell me that, hey, duck man, it's not gonna work. I don't know, I, I demonstrated, I show it's working, and I still get comments from the peanut gallery. A lot of jokes, of course. I mean, a lot of you have been really cool about it. Oh yeah, duck man, that's never gonna work, ha ha ha. Yeah, well, we know. But there's still some people that were absolutely serious, and new names, I'm talking new names I hadn't seen before, and some names that I have seen before. Some of you regulars that are always around, always commenting, and I thank you guys for it, that are just telling me it's not gonna work, and they don't give me any details as to why. Just no, it's not going to work. You're going to have an issue. It's going to bind. Oh, great. You know, thanks. <laughs> I don't think we're going to have any such problem. But anyway, the first thing that we are discussing here, the fact that the winders here, or actuators as we're going to call them from now on out, they had a tendency in the second video to lift that window as it came out. Now, the hinge that's on here only turns on one axis. It only goes like this. Because I had tape on it, and it's a bullshit hinge, you know, you can't just put tape on a door and expect it to hold it forever. It had a little bit of, you know, looseness to it. So it had a tendency to want to fall down, or if the motor was turning, it would have a tendency to want to raise it up a little bit. And that's incorrect. It's not the way it's designed to work, and that's not the way that they work on the Dodge Caravan that these came off of. So, <laughs> despite what people are thinking, we're not going to have any issues with it. We're going to be putting a stock beetle pop-out hinge up on the front here. And I thought for some reason that the hinges were really long, almost as long as the window, and that I could cut it in half and make two. Turns out the hinge is actually really short. It's only about this big, which is perfect for chop top windows because it'll fit right on in there just like it was stock and factory, unmodified. Put the four screws right into the sheet metal and then put the four screws into the surrounding glass frame that goes onto it. And that'll hold it just fine. I don't see any reason that the, the thing should drop. And if you need a demonstration on that, let me show you how hinges work. Now this here is a door. And these two things right here are called hinges. This allows the door to pivot on this fulcrum to be opened and closed this way. I actually do have to explain that because some people don't understand. But when I detach the latch mechanism on this end by pulling that handle, the door pivots on these hinges. So the door only goes this way. That's it. The door does not go up. It doesn't go down. <laughs> it doesn't open into the vehicle. It doesn't twist this way. It opens in and out only on these hinges. Even if I lift on the door, it's still gonna go straight. If I push down on the door, it's still gonna go straight. Unless, of course, I, I push down or lift up to the point of bending these things. But in the back, on that piece of glass, <laughs> the hinges that are on here will support the glass, and I should be able to open it right to here, and it should still open up straight in relation to the axis of those hinges. So if the little plastic arms on the end, they're a little floppy, it doesn't matter. They only have one purpose. Well, two purposes, technically. One is to open and one is to close. That's it. It's not designed to support the glass. Well, anyway, we're back. Obviously, hinges don't fall down. It's not a ball joint. There is a ball joint, however, on this end right here, which allows this thing. It's going to need some lube on it. These things have been sitting. You see, it's got all kinds of articulation on it. And it's designed to be that way in case, for some reason, that this window on, even on a caravan, may not open perfectly straight. If it didn't have a little bit of play in it, and just a little bit, it could cause it to bind on opening or closing. So in this case, it works just the same way. And you see, it, it turns in all directions on all axes because there actually is a ball joint in there. This is really not designed to support a whole lot of weight. It, it will pull the window into the frame and pull it tight, or when it comes on out, it will, will support it from, from going back in, but it's not designed to carry it up and down because that's just not how this works. You could even look at it, the design is just as so that that's not, not how it's gonna be. <laughs> well, I think that'll cover the mechanical portion on here as well as the hinges. And the next question I gotta ask is, hey, Duckman, what you using for switches? Well, for mock-up purposes, I was going to use a set of switches from a Dodge. Uh, this was sitting out on a lot over there at the scrap yard. I don't remember uh, what they came off of, but I like the fact that they were nice and, and rectangular and square, and that they pop out of this housing as one particular piece. So very easily I can cut a rectangular hole in something and I could 
snap this into place and have it look you know fairly modern with your power locks and, and all the other you know nice stuff that you see on there now i hadn't decided if i want to put this in the door on the left hand side yet or if i just want to drop it in the center console somewhere next to the e-brake handle and then one set of switches will operate both doors and that kind of simplifies things an awful lot then i don't have to set up a second switch on the other side i also kind of like that because then i can hide it these do not look very vintage and one of the things that i would really like to do on this car is add the vintage ivory switches to the dashboard some way making it look like it's completely stock and operate the switches and everything off of that but yeah i don't know if i'll use that if i wind up making an armrest or something but i'm a little limited for space up here in the front area of the vehicle because i'm kind of a big dude and my elbows and my knees tend to hit things i don't know that i want to put this in there this is something i will decide after i've got the car mostly put together and probably after i start driving it a little bit so i can get used to the 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 shape uh, the fit and the form of the vehicle compared to my body and with the ergonomics that i've decided put this in a comfortable location so yeah i'm not committed to this yet this is not necessarily something i'm going to be using but i do kind of like the idea of what it is i wish i remembered what dodge it came off of uh the thing had been debadged somebody took all the badges off of it and probably put them on their own vehicle because it got lost damaged stolen something happened to them, i'm sure but what i should have done like an idiot i didn't record the damn serial number uh, well, the VIN number off of the car. I could have taken that home, decoded it, and found out exactly what year, make, model the vehicle was. But anyway, yeah, I don't have that info. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Sorry. The next time I get out to the scrapyard, though, I'll pick that information up. If the car is still there, of course. <laughs> All right, let's step on inside here. We're going to talk about a couple things that are going on on the inside. And uh, I'll try to answer the questions you guys have been asking about these motors, where I got them, and the whole works about them. It's a good story, so you might want to stick around. Okay, now for all practical purposes, these electronic actuators are done. They're welded into place, they are mounted. The only thing that's left is to do a little bit of wiring on it and maybe even just a little touch-up welding. This one still has a little triangular hole over here. Over on the left-hand side, as you probably watched from yesterday's video over on Duckman Cycles, I got the left-hand side installed. And again, there's a couple places I need to do touch-ups. This side doesn't have any of those weird triangles though because I cut this box completely differently knowing what I was about to get into. Uh, you get to be an expert after you've done one the first time and as I said I thought this would take about two hours to put it in it actually took about 90 minutes from start to finish it's actually not too bad just a little bit of touch-up welding on this side and it should be done there's really not all too much to it uh, I thought it was pretty easy I mean really it was the first one like I said took about four hours second one 90 minutes not too bad but looking at these guys that you see on here you would think it's as easy as just going to a junkyard and picking up a couple motors right well not so the one here that's over on the right, which actually is a left-hand side motor, um, when I went to the junkyard, the first one I took off, it broke at the ball joint on the end. When I saw it was plastic and it was snapped off and there's no hope for anything, I just let it go. And I went to the next vehicle and went to pull off the next one. The next one I got off, I took it home, connected to electricity, and it worked. But at the same time, I went and I picked up the one for the right-hand side, which is over here on the left. And I brought that one home and connected it to power, and it would hum wouldn't open wouldn't close it would just hum so I, I tried to turn it manually a little bit see if I can get it to budge and sure enough I broke it free and then it turned just a little bit and stopped I reversed the polarity and it would turn just a little bit and stop and apparently it was a dead spot in the motor so I went back to the junkyard knowing that I had a 30-day warranty on it you know no problem when I went over there to get the new one I showed them what happened they didn't want to test it or try it they just said go out and get another one no problem you got to pay the two dollars insurance to go look hey no problem I'll give you two bucks Went out in the yard, grabbed another one. When I walked out the door, I showed it to him. I said, hey, listen, I got another motor. He says, good. He says, if you have any problems with it, he says, bring it back to me immediately today. We'll give you even another one. Oh, that's fair enough to me. So I took it home, connected it to power, and it didn't work. <laughs> and I was like, well, shit. You know, that's now, what, the, the third one that I've got that had a problem? So I went back to the junkyard, and, and I showed it to him, and I said, oh, yeah, it looks like I got another bad one. And he's like, oh, all right, you know, just go out in the yard and get another one. I said, and they have to give you the two bucks? He says, no, you paid earlier. 
He says it's two bucks a day. Come back as many times as you want, two dollars a day. So anyway, I went out in the junkyard. This time I was smart. I brought with me two nine volt batteries wired up in series, which gives you 18 volts. It's more than what these motors are intended for. But what I did was I took a little wiring harness that I had with me and I connected it to a right hand side motor, which is the one you're seeing on the left right now. And uh, when I put power on the next car I was gonna pull apart, nothing happened. I tried to budge the motor a little bit, gave it some power, nothing. I jumped to the next car, gave it a little power, nothing. Again, give it a little shake, a wiggle, still nothing. Went to the next, next car, gave it some power, motor opened and closed. Hey, good, looks like we got a good one. I started to unbolt it, and when I unbolted, I discovered the ball joint was broken on the end, just like the, on the other vehicle. So again, I had another bad one. So I took the motor, which was running, and I just put it down, and I went to the next vehicle. And when I got over to the next vehicle, I discovered that the motor on that one didn't work, but it had a good ball joint on it. So what I went is I went back over to that car and I grabbed the good motor and you see this pin that's on here and you can see where I, I tapped it with a hammer a little bit to knock it back in place. I shouldn't have done that, but yeah, I put a couple of dings in it by accident. I will clean that up and fix it. It's not gonna go into production on my car looking like that. I pulled this whole joint out, knocking out the pin, put it all back together. Now I had a working motor with a working ball joint and when I applied voltage to it, it opened and closed, no problem. I think I went through a total of uh, seven replacement motors. As I said, the first one on that side actually was good that I brought home, but I went through seven different motors before I finally got one that worked on this side. I mean, that was absolutely pathetic. But hey, it's a junkyard. And uh, as I said before, I only spent $7.50 uh, for each one of these. If you include the $2 fee that I paid twice, you know, we're talking $9.50 per motor. And that sure beats the uh, $60 per motor that you pay for brand new ones. And down the road, if they blow up or something and I just don't want to go back to the junkyard, I guess I'll just buy some new ones. It really doesn't matter to me that much. So that's the deal on that. Uh, <laughs> Kind of a kind of a big deal. I didn't make a whole lot of videos that day because I was going back and forth to the junkyard so much to get some new motors. It was just a real pain in the ass. Anyway, they are both in place now. I'm happy with that, and I think they should work out. As far as looks in the aesthetics department, as I said before, there will be a cover I'm going to be putting over the motor that goes like this. Now, a few people said, hey, Duckman, you know, you shouldn't weld the cover in on like that. If you weld the cover over it, you'll never get the motor out. Why the hell would I weld the cover over it? That doesn't make any sense to me. Why would I make them bolt in and bolt out if I'm just going to never replace them? Now, knowing what I do after having already gone through seven different bad motors just for the one side, that these do need to be accessible and they do need to be replaceable. And the cover that I put over this, however I'm going to make it look, it's probably going to be something like that, which will be covered with headliner material. Uh, will be mounted probably with four screws. I never elaborate on that. I might even just make a lip for it to slide into behind the carpet over here, and then just one or two screws on the top make it real easy to work on. You pull the headliner to here, glue it down, you wrap some headliner over the cover, and then just lay it over it and be done with it. I think it'll look nice, and um, I think that'll work out. In hindsight, had I thought about this a little bit more, when I was doing the, the uh, build-up of this car and I performed the roof chop, when I cut all that extra metal out of here, and there was a couple inches of extra metal that uh, came out of this uh, C-pillar area, what I should have done is, is bubbled it out this way. And I could have had a really thick C-pillar, and I could have recessed this motor a whole lot deeper than I've been able to do it with uh, approximately the stock thickness of the C-pillar. So yeah, I should have reformed this a little bit. I think I could have done a better job had I have thought of that in advance. But, you know, hindsight's 2020, and in this case, you know, I, there's no going back. What's done is done. And I'm happy with it. I'm committed. I don't have any problems with, with what we've got right here. I think it's pretty cool. And one of the other things I discovered, by the way, you guys, uh, these are from a Dodge Caravan, but a Dodge Caravan is the same as a Volkswagen Rutan. And I was like, a Volkswagen Rutan? What the hell is that? Well, while I was out in the scrapyard just looking for other miscellaneous parts, over in the import area, I saw what looked like to me like a Dodge Caravan, but it had a Volkswagen logo on it. And well, what the hell is that? As I got to looking, I'm like, this is a Dodge. So I quickly Googled it and discovered it's a Volkswagen Rutan, and Rutans are actually um, rebranded Dodge Caravans, and Volkswagen had them for, I don't know, about six, seven years or something. They actually manufactured them for quite a while, but they sold very, very few of them. Very, very few. So as a result, only finding one on the junkyard is not too big of a surprise. So technically, if you really want to look at it that way, these are Volkswagen parts. So <laughs> not going too far off, I could say that at car shows, hey, these are from our Volkswagen Rutan. 
And actually, I believe the Rutan started a couple years after this particular motor. This motor is late 90s Rutan, didn't start until early 2000s. But, you know, I can play with that a little bit technically for anybody that wants to shoot me down to say that I'm saying the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah, I know, you're right, you're right. Yeah, Rutan actually came, came at a later date. But, anyway, yeah, Rutan, Dodge Caravan, same damn thing. Now, one of the most ridiculous questions that I got asked, and you guys aren't going to believe this one, is why would I use such a crappy, ugly piece of plexiglass for my car when I'm building such a beautiful car? Why would I ever want to put this on there and keep it that way? You know, why won't I make some effort into like de-yellowing it or buffing the scratches out of it or the burn marks, welders that have hit it? You know, why, why would I be so disgusting to use something like this on my vehicle? Really? <laughs> it's a template. It has no purpose other than be a template for something that's going to get dropped on the ground. Hey, there you go. I hit the ground again. Couldn't possibly do that with a nice brand new piece of glass. And this car is going to be all glass. So, I mean, hello. I don't care how ugly the Plexi is. It doesn't matter. Does it matter to you guys? Really? Does it matter? Does it matter? Does it matter? It doesn't matter to me one bit. Not one bit at all. So if anybody's going to criticize that my ugly piece of yellowed Plexi is a piece of trash, you're right. That's what it is. It came out of the backyard. This used to be a windshield on a sand rail. It's probably close to 20 years old. It's just an old piece of Plexi. I mean, it's just, it's disgusting. It's, it's been eaten by acetone. It's, uh, it's got paint on it. It's got a, a weld burn. <laughs> I mean, it's just in terrible, terrible shape. Why would I even bother trying to buff that de-yellow it or shine it up? That makes no sense to me. This is temporary, and I'm not going to waste my time on trying to make a shiny piece of plexiglass. So for those of you that are telling me to do that, you guys obviously don't run your own YouTube channel because putting work into things like that is a waste of friggin' time. I've got a deadline. I've got to get this car together by the end of the month because it's going to Earl for paint. That's right. It's headed off to Classic Car Creations over in Cocoa, Florida. And Earl's going to be putting the final coat onto Eleanor as well as um, finalizing, fi <sighs> finalating, filleting. He's going to be filleting my bodywork. <laughs> Earl's going to love that. <laughs> He's uh, going to finalize my bodywork. He's going to smooth everything out. He's, he's going to bop the nipples and, and poke the dingles and you know make the car nice and smooth flat and it's going to look like glass when I get it back. If you want to know what color she's going to be, you need to subscribe to Earl. Duckshit.net forward slash CCC. Once you hit that, it will forward you immediately to Earl's YouTube channel. And when you get there, you can watch the video where he had his Pensacola trip and he came over and he looked at Eleanor and uh, he really likes the project and he's really excited about taking it on. He's actually been watching the progress on this car for a number of years and he had no idea. He, he and I actually have known each other for longer than I've been working on this. But he didn't realize I was the same person for some reason. He just, he had no idea. He had been subscribed to me and, and all his guys have been watching me in the shop. So I was like kind of a little shop celebrity even though truly I'm not. But <laughs> thank you Earl, I really appreciate you and I thank you for um, for wanting to take on Eleanor and I'm really excited to get her out to you at the end of next month. This is June, that'll be July of 2019. And we're gonna give him as much time as he needs with Eleanor. I, I do not expect to see her uh, until after the first of the year. And that would be a good thing because it's just gonna be so damned hot. Uh, when I get this thing back, I don't wanna be sweating like a pig uh, trying to put this thing back together. I'm already doing that now, trying to hurry to get this car together for Earl. And well, it's got a, a lot of little welding here and there and a little bit of grinding. I'm trying to take as much of the burden off of him as possible because if I get the car with less work on him, that means it's going to be less cost to me because he's a professional and his time is really worth some money, really worth some money. So in order for me to keep the cost down, yeah, I got to make the car as right as I can get her. And then after that, I send it off. Why am I not painting the car myself? Well, because I'm not a painter. I don't have the ability to sand things down and get them quite as smooth and as clean as they need to be. I, I don't have the feel for what it takes to lay paint absolutely flat and not get a bunch of dirt in it or, or make runs or have bugs landing in it and just, I, don't know, I painted the engine. And the reason why I painted the engine is because there's lots of little facets to it and it's very small shapes and you get a little dirt on that, you'll never see it. It doesn't really matter. But on something like this with big panels and swooping curves, you're going to see everything in it. So this needs to be done by a professional. I think the only way to do Eleanor any justice, because I think, I think she's gorgeous. Really, I do think she's gorgeous, is to send her off to a professional. And that's why she's going to Earl at Classic Car Creations. Once again, duckshit.net. Head over there, subscribe. You're going to want to be there because he's going to do the color reveal. That's right. You're not going to see it on this channel until I get it back. So when he starts laying that paint, you're going to know what color she's going to be. 
And the last question that I keep getting asked and answered it a couple videos ago, am I gonna make any other windows pop outs? And the answer is no. No, I, I have an option to put a pop out in the front, like a safari type windshield. I even talked to Jeremy over there, VW Loose Nuts, really nice guy, by the way, if you're gonna buy a pop out windshield, he's the only guy I would buy from. But I just don't wanna deal with the possibility of leaks. Uh, the only pop outs I want on here are the side ones and they're really not known for leaking. Even when you're driving forward, you know, the rain has a tendency to slick past it. Whereas in the front, that's gonna be a high pressure area where the wind is gonna to want to push rain in from around the sides. And this car has seen enough flood. This car has seen enough water damage. I, I don't need Eleanor filling up with water anymore. Last year at the car show, the uh, entire floor pans filled up with water because she had no glass in her yet. And as soon as the uh, closing ceremony was performed for the car show. As soon as everybody started to disperse and walk away, right at that second, the sky opened up and it started to pour. I mean, the timing couldn't have been any better. It, it did not ruin our car show at all. But I tried to throw some tarps over her and stuff, but I just couldn't get them over fast enough. And I mean, it was coming down so hard that, yep, she flooded and her floor pans were full of water. <laughs> so I had to deal with it. I just started mopping it out and scooping it up and then I coated the entire car with phosphoric acid again. It looks like I need to hit a couple more spots again. It's actually held up really well the last time because last time I, I soaked it. I mean, I put it on kind of heavy and I let it sit and just let it sit until it dried itself up. And I didn't try to wipe off any of the dust. I just left it there. And that uh, effectively does seal the metal and stops it from uh, rusting out. Well, I think that's gonna cover the pop out questions that I've gotten on this, as well as a few other questions in regards to why I'm doing what I'm doing here and trying to get this car off for paint. So if you don't know already, this is Eleanor, my 1956 Beetle. This is Mad Styles. He's somebody else that you guys need to be subscribing to. He's got a smaller YouTube channel. He does all kinds of tool restoration videos, and he's also doing a Volkswagen right now. He's very, very active up on my Facebook group page. So I suggest that you go over to Mad Styles. There'll be a link down in the video description. There'll also be one in the first post comment, which is uh, pinned in the video comments there. So find him, clicky clicky, go to his page, subscribe, check out his other stuff. He's working on some cool projects too. Really, really nice guy. I had to wear a shirt for my video. Anyways, thanks for watching, you guys. Really do appreciate it. Like, comment, subscribe. Check out duckshit.net for all my different social media platforms that I participate on. There's a whole bunch of them. And if I'm not active here on YouTube, you'll probably find me active in one of the other ones. So if you're into what I do, check it out. And if you're into a little skeeter, that's right, Skeeter the Duck's still with me after 17 years, check out my Instagram. You'll find the, the link up on duckshit.net. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time.